have a few opening remarks. I do want to encourage those of you that haven't paid your dues to please send them into Ron Schaller. Enough said on that. Um, the other item that I want to mention is the social gathering, which has been postponed by Gwen Patton, to, and it will be it's rescheduled now to February the 16th. And that's going to be at the Littleton Museum. People are going to meet there at 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's, um, I think there, Carl sent out an email to this on the, the 3rd of February. And this is to support the three members that we have uh, of Focus Camera Club that are in Eye of the Camera exhibits there. Uh, Gwen Patton, Oz Feniger, and Ron Schaller all have, have entries that uh, were there. And then I think there's, it's, this is a social, after people look at the images and do, then there's gonna be a little bit of lunch afterwards. So I would encourage you to, to participate in that. Um, you can reach out to Gwen uh, to let her know that you're coming, that would be good. Uh, the next meeting is in two weeks. That's gonna be on February the 23rd. It's our competition meeting and the subject is winter, winter theme. So you can go on the website and look at the definition of, of winter for that. I won't repeat that to you. Um, just looking around, we've got one guest this this to join us this after to join us tonight by the name of Re Maria Demara, and we talked a little bit about Maria. I, you know, Maria, I'll give you a little bit of a heads up more than I did earlier. The structure of our of our club is that we have twice two meetings a month. the The second Wednesday we have a program meeting which you're attending, and then the fourth Wednesday is a competition or really better put as a critique. It's, it's people submit images. There's a judge that gives them feedback as well as a score. And it's meant to be educational. Uh, as I mentioned to you, we're currently on Zoom, but we're moving towards more of a hybrid type of meeting where um, it will be kind of Zoom as well as in person. That remains to be known if we're gonna do that in April or May or June, it depends on on Lone Tree uh, Civic Center and their, their government when we're allowed to, to do, uh, to attend those in person. So I, you know, I would like you to introduce yourself, Marie, and tell us a little bit about yourself. And as we talked about earlier, I'd like to understand a little bit better what you're looking for in a camera club. That's, that's kind of interesting. And then if you also have questions about our club, I would welcome your questions. So I'll turn that over to you, Maria. Awesome, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Maria. Um, I join you as a hobbyist. Um, I'm into kind of astrophotography, landscape and nature type stuff. And the reason I wanted to come to these meetings and get a feel for it and potentially join is I'm kind of looking for a place to learn and grow in a community setting and kind of get that feedback as well. It's really hard when you're just looking and judging at your own stuff. So um, those are kind of the main reasons why. Very good. I mean, I would encourage you to, you know, join us again two weeks from now. We, we kind of get a, you know, we've got a, a great judge scheduled um, and uh, he's very experienced. He's a professional uh, photographer, but, uh, you know, I mean, just to kind of understand maybe how we're structured, Maria. So, you know, I welcome you tonight. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And so. You know, like you say, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. There's contact information on the website, on, on the portal there. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. You bet, of course. So, well, we're moving quite along. So I guess our speaker tonight is Ken Smith. Uh, you know, Gwen Patton actually approached Terry Hanford and I, who are the co-chairs of, of programs for this year. Kind of let us know about Ken. I had no idea. There's so many, you know, wonderful photographers out there in the universe, but but Gwen had actually met uh, Ken, I think at Golden, in Golden at an art show, if I remember right. And so she knew of him. And just talking to Ken a little bit, I mean, I think that he moved from the Castle Rock area in 2019 to Eastern Tennessee. And, um, you know, so he, his website is, is a fantastic, you know, overview of, of so many different genres. It's just amazing. Um, you know, of that, his, his website, if, you know, is Ken Smith Gallery, all connected words, kensmithgallery.com. So I would, would very much encourage you to take the time to explore many of his beautiful images. And I know that he specializes in fine art, nature, and Americana images. And I don't know many people that specialize in Americana images, but I, I love, I love what I've seen on his website. So, Without taking any more time, I'll, I'll introduce Ken and have him 
tell us a little bit more about himself and start his program. So welcome, Kim. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate uh, I appreciate being here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I can uh, mess this up and share my screen. So um, I'm excited to be here tonight. I really am. And so as I share with you about who I am and my walk through photography, uh, the only thing that I'm going to ask is if you have any questions to just kind of hold, uh, hold them, hold your thoughts, and uh, then feel free to ask away when I'm done. So uh, with that, um, I was born in 1959. And ironically, that was the year that steam operations came to an end on every major railroad. A few of those uh, old steamers still operated on short lines, but they would eventually fall to the rise of the diesel locomotive. And this was uh, considered progress, and nothing would stand in the way of this new era of railroad operations. Now, my father would take me to see trains, and occasionally he would even take me on a train ride. I grew up in Chicago, and that was really the rail hub of the nation. There were trains everywhere. There were giant stations that are all but gone today. Chicago had the L, and I remember as a kid growing up seeing these grand old green and white electric trains running around the city high above the streets below. My mother also loved trains, and as a child, mom traveled by train to New York several times with her parents. Uh, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford was the train that they would uh, travel on during those years. My first train set was given to me by my parents on Christmas. It was a Lionel Santa Fe F3 Warbonnet diesel. And I received this on that all too familiar four by eight sheet of green plywood. It was all up and set up and running Christmas morning and ran it did. It eventually graduated to the garage and there I began expanding uh, my train layout with bridges and scenery. I became addicted to a magazine called Model Railroader Magazine. And in one such copy was an article written by the late and legendary photographer and master model builder, John Allen. Now, John uh, had a amazing empire and it was, it was legendary. John was a photographer by trade and he became addicted to the hobby ironically by creating realistic looking scenes for Varney Manufacturing, a company that made kits for model railroaders. They wanted to place their kits in realistic looking scenes and John made it happen. John became so obsessed with model building that he built a model masterpiece that is still regarded uh, as the greatest model railroad of all time, the gory and defeated. And sadly, John passed away at, the early, at an early age from a heart attack. Equally devastating was his masterpiece was destroyed by fire 10 days after his death from a tragic accident within the home. By the time this happened, I was in my early teens. So we eventually moved from Chicago to Hamden, Indiana. And after graduating eighth grade, um, the layout uh, ended up uh, in my basement. I witnessed more train traffic in a few square miles than I ever could have imagined. I saw short lines like the South Shore, the Indiana Harbor Belt, the East Joliet and Elgin, as well as main lines like the Norfolk and Western, Louisville and Nashville, Wabash, Baltimore and Ohio, and the Chesapeake and Ohio. There were interlocking towers in the city and crossing shanties that had crossing guards in them. And I got to know several of them as a kid. They would allow me to actually hold the stop sign for cars as the crossing gates were lowered. And obviously this was much different culture back then. My parents wanted me to attend a private high school in Colorado, and so I quickly adapted and was asked to be the yearbook photographer, since I had mentioned that I was the eighth grade yearbook photographer. And I didn't have uh, a camera, but the school did. So I got introduced to the famous Pentex K1000. I shot black and white film because that's, it was a small school and that's all the uh, school could afford. And the yearbook was eventually uh, uh, all done in black and white anyway, because it was more cost effective. 
I caught myself wrapped up in catching the moment and trying to communicate a story with a photo rather than just taking post shots. And it really became fascinating and I quickly saw myself becoming a photojournalist. In fact, it was the direction that I really wanted to head in. When I returned home in 1977, I was in the middle of a serious depression in the Midwest and my father had a heart attack and was unable to work. So I ended up having to make the brutal decision to forego college and begin becoming the breadwinner for my family. At first, I figured it would only be temporary, but life has a tendency of throwing curveballs your way that you're just not able to hit. During a very strenuous job search, I received two offers for employment on the same day. One was with a small hometown Indiana newspaper called the Hammond Times. And the other was with Sears Roebuck and Company in the nearby robust outdoor mall in Calumet City, Illinois. There was no question as to which job I should take, or that at least is how it was posed to me. Go with Sears. You'll never make money taking pictures. They all bellowed. Needless to say, I went with the flow. Sears did have its perks, and soon I was able to purchase my first camera, the KS500. When the Pentex came out and similar functions to the Pentex K1000, I was off the ground running again. Back then, employees received massive discounts, especially when it came to merchandise that was either not picked up or returned from the catalog department. Most of that merchandise channeled um, to the store departments, and I was able uh, to start expanding my gear because of uh, what was returned. I soon outfitted uh, my camera with gear and lenses and ended up getting a, a dark room. I immersed myself with books and learned by trial and error. The camera department uh, started to display my images that I captured and developed. And then it happened. I got a call from one of the salespeople there and a customer had inquired about purchasing a photo I had on display. I was like, wow, really? What, what in the world should I even sell it for? And it was suggested that I sell for $20. So back in 1979, I made my first sale. And this is the image. So what do you do when you make money selling photography? Well, you, you buy more gear. I mean, isn't that what you're supposed to do? And so I acquired the fabulous Pentex ME Super. And to this day, I personally believe it's one of the best ever 35 millimeter film cameras out there, second probably only to the Nikon F3. In 1982, kids came to the dark room, and so the dark room ended up having to go in the, because it was set up in the spare bedroom. With kids now entering the picture, there wasn't time or extra money to spend in my hobby, and so the gear went down into the closet and stayed there for the next 11 years. I moved to Colorado, happened in 1993, and the change of scenery and the existence of a narrow gauge uh, steam locomotive uh, rekindled my interest in photography. And so I spent the next seven years kind of dabbling in it again. I photographed the kids growing up, the scenery around me, and occasionally I'd make a trip to the railroad museum in Golden or chase a train somewhere. The divorce happened in 2000. I spent some time reflecting on what to do and dusted off myself and eventually I remarried to a wonderful lady and my love for photography rekindled because she had a love for the outdoors. We eventually married in 2004 and for the next four years I was photographing especially when we were out together. I also began modeling again and I ended up doing something that was unheard of then taking models outdoors and blending them into the surrounding environment. I ran the idea by a model railroad magazine publisher that I knew, and he loved the idea. Shooting in Fuji Velvia, the images came alive in print. And in this annual was the first time anyone had ever done anything like this. And the readers wanted more. I ended up doing another article uh, for this quarterly magazine, and then I received a call from yet another magazine to see if I'd be interested in doing a series, which ended up leading to 13 months worth of very pressurized work. After nearly three years, 
of doing articles for four different magazines. I took a bit of a breather from all of that and I began photographing trains again. First, it was just at the museum, but then I began to purposefully shoot with composition in mind, as well as an interesting subject. If you will, I was waiting in new waters. And they say that lightning doesn't strike the same place twice, but I would disagree. 32 years later, I faced yet another pivotal moment. While my wife and I were in the San Juans, I ended up taking this picture. And it's a picture that changed everything, not because it's technically perfect or beautiful, because it's not. There are lots of things that I could have done better with this, but that's not the place to point it out. I was just shooting for me, that's all. No magazine work, no pressure, no deadlines to meet. It was just for me. I posted this image on one of the model railroad forums and someone said, you should sell that. Very familiar words. No doubt words that we've probably all heard, but I took a second look at the possibility, but from a uniquely different angle. I was building models and I was a nut for getting details right. I wanted my models to look real. And so I would take photos like this of real things strictly from a documentary standpoint. I wanted to replace details as accurately as possible. I also knew that there was not a single source out there that you could get a lot of this type of information. So I compiled my images together and created the No Phil Frills Model CD Guide series. And they're essentially photos on CD for model railroaders to use as reference photos. Today, I have over 50 different discs and 14 years later, I still sell them to modelers all over the globe. But I also began taking my photography serious. More photos required yet more gear. And if I was going to take things to the next level, I needed to invest in gear that would get me there. So I began selling my fine art train images at train shows. Um, and these train shows were not only in the Denver area, but they were as far as Council Bluffs to the east, Salt Lake City to the west, everything up and down the Front Range. I started applying to juried art festivals, getting into some, getting rejected to others, but constantly learning from my mistakes and continuing to hone in on my skills, I eventually went full time in 2012 as a photographer. I had a very successful career doing fine art shows all over the USA, getting into some of the biggest and best in the country. Before retiring from the art festival circuit in May of 2021, beginning in 2014, I felt the nudge to begin storytelling with my work. In other words, I was getting the desire to do something along the lines of photojournalism, but artful. Storytelling with a twist, if you will, making something look historical or vintage. And it all started with a cowboy shoot that I did with a friend uh, that he had arranged. We were meeting in Ridgeway to chase fall color. He had a friend who had a relationship with a cattle rancher who spread was just up Owl Creek Pass. It was an amazing opportunity. We were there for only a couple of hours, but in that time, I began seeing myself doing work that was completely different and artful. It was capturing a moment in time with a unique element that communicated a story. I didn't know what I was gonna do with the vision that I just had, but I knew I could do something like this with trains. That was a subject that I was very familiar with. So I headed off to Chama, New Mexico, to the Colorado Railroad Museum, and I began photographing employees working there. Most often it was and employees just doing their jobs. But in some cases, I would pose them like I did with Dusty here, oiling the drive rod bearings at the Colorado Railroad Museum and him grabbing this water tank or water bag for a drink. I enjoyed this, but I wanted to take things yet to another level to expand my portfolio as well as pushing my comfort level. So in 2015, I decided to begin doing still lifes. At first, I didn't, all I had was some basic studio style images with some controlled soft lighting. I was spending time locating objects at garage sales and antique shops and eBay, 
I kept most everything I acquired because I wasn't sure just when and if I was going to use them again. While I like the results of several of the images, I wanted to push the envelope even further. It's just how I'm wired. I didn't like a lot of research, or I should say I did lots of research on light painting images, but I wanted to be sure I came up with my own style. I didn't want to copy somebody else's work. So I began experimenting with a single frame capture over a very long exposure, 25 to 30 seconds. There, there were lots of trial and error doing this, but I think of it as how Thomas Edison said, opportunity is mixed by most, opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. So consider the setup that you're looking at. To begin with, I was setting up and tearing down these shots in my garage. I had limited space to work with, so everything had to be portable, including the desk. While the props were easy enough to manage, a desk isn't. So to create a desk, I used a piece of vinyl wood flooring that you see that could roll up and be stored when not in use. The same with the backdrop. After nearly 200 attempts to get a single exposure that had light and shadow the way I wanted it, I ended up with this image. I really enjoyed this. And I kept learning by trial and by error. I was amazed at the public response at art festivals and gallery exhibitions. I was creating art that people from all walks of life were connecting to. Musicians connected to my work and it didn't matter if they played the instrument or not. I began creating images that became fun for me to do, like Babe Ruth's Locker. I became a stickler for trying to get details as accurate as I could, just like I was when I was building models. In this image, the accountant, even the IRS tax form is a period correct copy. I began to even take this technique to another new level, a single 25 to 30 second exposure using two different light sources with two different light temperatures. A good read was the end result. Using candles became one of the most challenging long exposures I have done to date. In order to accomplish this, I had to light the candles prior to killing the lights in the garage and opening the shutter on the camera. I was dressed in all black, including black gloves. Once the candles were lit, the lights were turned off and the shutter was open. After one second, I stood in front of the camera with the shutter still open, blocking the set, and I blew out the candles. When the smoke cleared, I then began light painting everything else. It took, it took me two 12-hour days and nearly 100 exposures to get the right amount of candlelight, and fire flicker, and light painting to all come together. The same held true for this image, wine, roses, and music. I worked on this technique and created images like this for the next three years, getting better and faster all the time. But as an artist, I'm never satisfied. There has to be another hill to conquer or another subject that yields to my camera. And that happened to me in 2017. I got the crazy idea of taking vintage bicycles and photographing them in nostalgic settings. Again, I wanted it to be unique to my style of shooting, as well as my style in post-production editing. I called this new, body work, this new body of work American Peddlers. I purchased 17 vintage bicycles, and I went on a journey with them. At first, I spent time researching ghost signs, as they are called old business advertisements painted on business building walls that have faded over time, like this one. I really liked many of the old advertisements for Coca-Cola, and there were plenty that were still around all over the U.S. But there were also scenes that I stumbled on. 
as I was out driving back roads, like no parking. The thought of a kid just leaving his tricycle sitting next to that sign told the story in and of itself. Then there was a chase from Denver to Monument Valley for a shot that I had never seen created before at a place every photographer shoots at. And I think you know the spot too. Dubbed Forest Gump Point, I captured Epic Journey just before the inversion covered everything. Everything on the bike, from the bedroll to the canteen, are period correct. I traveled sections of Route 66, and in Commerce, Oklahoma, I set up Route 66 cookies just after sunrise and before they opened. Across the street, I made Allen's Film Station using a bike I had purchased earlier from a guy who saw me setting up a scene, believe it or not, in Kansas. Being a baseball fan, fan, I was less than a mile from one of the greatest baseball players to ever wear pinstripes. Mickey's place was taken at Mickey Mantle's boyhood home. And if you are as old as I am, this picture needs no explanation. Every boy did it. But with the vintage bikes came surprises too. So since I purposed to take back roads everywhere I went, I found places that I wasn't expecting, like Chicks and Seed. But my best find was in Windsor, Colorado. I responded to a bicycle for sale ad that I saw on Facebook Marketplace. Made my trip up to pick up this vintage bike. Before ending my call with this seller, I told him I was getting the bike for my American Peddlers project. And he told me to bring my camera gear to his shop. He said I would not be disappointed. I agreed and so he was spot on when I got there. As it turned out, he restored vintage bikes and his shop was an old Chevy dealer from the 1930s. It still had the wooden service doors from the shop to the showroom floor. He also built a fake service station in the shop area. I was able to capture some amazing images with extremely rare bikes like Signs of the Times. I ended up creating over a dozen different images while I was there. I didn't have to go far either for some of my vintage bicycle images. Shoeshine was taken in Colorado, up in Victor. Another photo taken in Victor was the newspaper boy. The back of the bike has a vintage newspaper boy saddlebag. Downtown Denver yielded Brooklands. And I actually worked with the owner after they closed to keep all of the neon lights and the outdoor lights on long enough for me to get this image. A drive in the mountains allowed me to create plein air painting. In the fall, I strapped a red Hiawatha hoping for the right Aspen shot that I could place a bike in. And I found it in Ophir and Red Cruiser was born. I also created the past, if you will, with the help of Photoshop. In a small isolated town in Kansas, I found the perfect storefront to recreate a telegram store. Large cities had Western Union telegram stores that oftentimes had telegrams delivered via messengers using bikes. Since these bikes are very rare and quite expensive, I made one getting uh, a sign custom printed for me from the lab that I actually used in uh, Colorado. I then placed a carrier bag on the front of the bike and placed the bike next to the storefront. And in post-production, I fogged the glass and made all of the stencil signs that you see. My personal favorite was also one of the hardest images to capture using a bike. I wanted a beach scene. And so I took this 1939 Elgin girl, girl's bike all the way to the Florida Panhandle in search for the right bench or right beach and fence. It took three days of stopping and looking before I found the location for Summer Breeze. And ironically, it was the in the low 50s when I took this image. 
which is probably the reason that nobody was in the water that day. I continued placing vintage bikes and scenes like this for the next two years and created over 60 images with these vintage bikes. Occasionally I would find old bikes sitting around like this image uh, in, that I took in Oklahoma, which fit right in with my body of work. I also continued to shoot other subject matter that I had been accustomed to shooting either in home or on location like ledgers. But in August of 29, we decided to move to Tennessee and I began the difficult decision of sorting through what was going to be left behind and sold and what was moving with me. And so I sold all of the bikes and about half of the still props that I had been acquiring since I began shooting them. Some of the still props I kind of regret selling, but I'm currently planning on another project for 2023. In October of 2019, we arrived in our new home in Tennessee. For the next two months, we unpacked and settled in. Then while doing the number one ranked art festival uh, show in the country in March of 2020, you know what happened. I raced to get home with the, uh, when the show was over and there I stayed all the way until September. I had three photo shoots planned that year in between 24 shows that I had scheduled. 20 shows canceled within weeks. As to the photo shoots, one was a, a week in Colorado shooting vintage trains. The second was going to be in Michigan um, shooting World War II aviation, in the, uh, which also included an air-to-air -air shoot. And the third was uh, a steam train in Pennsylvania called the East Broadtop that was in the process of reopening after it closed operations back in 2011. And it pretty much looked like none of this was gonna happen, but the World War II shoot and the East Broadtop ended up pulling through and I was out shooting again. With our World War II shoot, all of the photography took place outdoors except for the air-to-air -air shoot. I was on a C, uh, C-47 or a DC-3. Uh, this is a C-47 World War II paratrooper aircraft and did this with five other friends. In order for this to work, we all had to wear masks. And I wasn't concerned about that. The back three windows were removed from the aircraft, which allowed us clear shooting without glass or the wings in the way. We began with all of the ground shooting first. We had two specific themes in mind, World War II pinups that were tastefully done as well as a Rosie the River river style shots that were done inside the hangar. The second was going to be servicemen in action. I want to mention here that all of these reenactors that you see volunteered their time. Each of them invest their own money in period correct clothing, uniforms, and props to make this all happen. The Yankee Air Museum charged a very reasonable rate that we all contributed towards. So up first were the Rosies. They were done early as the planes were still in the hangar and needed to be outside eventually. Scenes, uh, uh, several different scenes were, were, shut, were set up quickly to do this. One of our Rosies pulled uh, a double duty and would later be dressed as a woman Air Force service pilot or otherwise known as a wasp. Uh, when we finished with the uh, Rosie shoot, the aircraft were brought outside for the remainder of the day. We had a total of four aircraft that we would use between the ground shots and the air to air. Three of them were World War II aircraft and the third would be a Vietnam Huey. The focus for the afternoon was the B-25 Mitchell and the B-17 Flying Fortress. To keep things moving, we shot around both planes setting up different scenes at each aircraft. If you could think of it, it was set up, reenactors discussing daylight bomb runs. Yes, these guys actually talked as if they were really planning a bomb run. Notice how accurate everything is down to the maps. These are real maps, World War II maps, that the captain located on eBay. Crew shots were popular during World War II. 
So we did, we did it for the B-25 with the correct number of crewmen, as well as the B-17, um, both with the World War II crew, crew vehicle, like you see here, and one without. Even casual images like this one called Chit Chat found its place in my portfolio. As we mix things up between crews and planes, we also photographed some classy pinups. The ladies had several outfits that they had used um, to make this uh, shoot both interesting and fun. We not only did uh, shots uh, by the World War II staff car here that you see, but we also did shots using the World War II Jeep um, that were both staged, as well as photos that were impromptu. Of course, we all did um, uh, more uh, classic pinups near the aircraft, such as Lady in Red. We also uh, snuck in a pilot style pinup, if you will, in the last minute that was also kind of impromptu. Next, we took a few additional photos of our Wasp reenactor, who I mentioned earlier pulled double duty as a Rosie. I had the pleasure of photographing Allison on several occasions from period shots from the 30s to the 50s, and each time she just brings her natural talent to the table. You will see her in another photo shoot I did in 2021. Plenty of poses and individual shots were completed throughout the day, but then it was time to load up into the C-47 and do the air-to-air -air shoot. Our first, our first aircraft was a Vietnam Huey. The Huey actually had to leave before we did, the fastest that it can travel was also the very slowest that the C-47 could travel. So we didn't have much time to do any shooting. A couple of quick passes is all we had time for. We wanted the bulk of our time devoted for the Flying Fortress. Yankee Lady was right on time. Capturing this magnificent bird in flight during the magic hour was nothing short of the highlight of my career. Perfect weather made this, this shoot happen. There was a constant communication between the aircraft so that each pilot knew what the other was doing. Seeing a B-17 in person is one thing. Being this close to it in flight is another. What is amazing is that you can actually hear it in the distance over the rumble of the C-47 engines. And that actually surprised me. Equally challenging was shooting a moving object from a moving object. You really don't have time to keep looking at the back of your camera to check settings and composition, exposure, focus. You have to rely on your skills and knowledge and your gut instinct of your camera and the aircraft and how things are going to move around. For example, to capture propeller blur like you see, you need to be shooting at around 120th of a second. If you start shooting faster, you freeze the propeller in place and you lose the effect of motion. But you also have to have a sharp image. So you really want depth of field and a full understanding of your gear and your aircraft and your surroundings help to make it all happen. Up next was the B-25, Mitchell. We were quickly running out of light. So we didn't have much time to work with. I'm personally okay with that because the B-17 was what I really wanted to photograph. A couple of quick shots of the B-25 and then one with both planes together as the sun is setting. And that's all the time we had. And we started heading back to the airfield in Willow Run, Michigan. As soon as we landed, we immediately started setting up for some night shots of all the aircraft. We did a quick paratroop uh, paratrooper shoot with the C-47. This was for safety reasons as we did not want anyone near any running aircraft. When we completed several different poses, we fired up the engines on the C-47 and did night shoots with the engines running. Each aircraft ran for about five minutes, giving us the opportunity for head-on shots and angle shots. The Ford Tri-Motor was just restored. It was not certified by the FAA to fly yet, but an engine startup was permissible. Since the, propellers and uh, since the propellers are polished aluminum, it had kind of a cool electrified look to them as the engines ran. Then we shot the B-25, just like the previous aircraft, angle and head-on shots were all completed. 
Daylight flood lamps are used for all of the lighting. Each aircraft was already in position, so lighting had to be moved. The B-17 Flying Fortress and its four double Wasp, Pratt, and Whitney engines being throttled up is a sound like no other. That especially holds true when you are only about 30 yards in front of her. Imagine seeing dozens of these flying overhead in World War II. The Huey was the last, but was also one of the most unexpected events of the evening. The pilot actually lifted the aircraft up about five feet off the ground and rotated it. I wasn't honestly sure if it was an accident or on purpose. So a bit of the fear factor set in, but it was a great way to end a full day of incredible photography. I mentioned earlier that the other photo shoot planned was the East Broadtop, which took place about six weeks later. The East Broadtop is a narrow gauge railroad that took uh, coal ore to mainline connections from, for the Pennsylvania Railroad. When the East Broadtop, or EBT, shut down in 1956, the railroad was sold to a salvage scrapper. The scrapper didn't dismantle it right away, and uh, through a very unique chain of events, it was restored to full operation as a tourist railroad. It remained in operation until 2011 when the doors closed a second time. Still intact, another chain of events led to a sale to an interested group of investors who are slowly bringing it to life again. Steam is expected to run in 2022, and it's my intention to photograph it. Since nothing was actually running, we used smoke bombs that created the essence of steam locomotives actually in operation when in fact they had been pushed in location for photo props. Battery powered light bulbs were placed in the locomotive headlights um, and railroad employees were used as reenactors. Buildings and equipment dating back over a century survived a scrapper's torch not once, but twice. It's virtually impossible to get, a real get inside a real working railroad, but the EBT made it happen. The employees got, in, got into what we were doing as much as they did. From inside the machine shop to outside around the turntable and the roundhouse, everything was perfect to recreating a vintage look dating back into the 30s. And fall color only helped to add an extra element. Outdoor night shots were equally realistic, again, using smoke bombs. They only had, they, these bombs, by the way, only last a few minutes. So shooting fast is vital. Constant lighting equipment, like we used for the aircraft, um, was used. When it was all done, 14 solid hard hours on my feet seemed worth it. It closed out 2020 as a successful year, not only from a photographic standpoint, but as a way to make yet another pivot. I began looking at doing even more of these reenactment photo shoots for 2021, as well as leaving the art festival show circuit and spend more time at home. Both ended up being smart decisions. 2021 yielded two more very nostalgic photo shoots. The first was in Port Clinton, Ohio, at the Liberty Air Museum, and the second was at the Henry River Mill Village in Hickory, North Carolina. Originally, the Liberty Air Museum was to be a two-day photo shoot along with one night. However, weather has a final say-so on any of these events. And rain was in the forecast, and rain it did. And it came down in biblical proportions. I got a few shots off with my Model A that I brought there in the Ford Tri-Motor, and that was about it. Day one was to be all of the tri-motor and a few other vintage aircraft. And day two was supposed to be World War II aircraft and a night shoot. So everything had to be crammed in one day, which lasted 20 full hours. We began with the tri-motor. Um, and uh, moving the car around as well as uh, uh, well around the aircraft. Uh, gave us some different angles and 
some lighting options. We left the tow vehicle attached to the aircraft, making this much easier to accomplish. Then putting the car in a location uh, to hide the tow vehicle whenever possible really helped to set things up well. Of course, adding a person or two always helps to bring, a life, uh, bring life to an image. Continuing with another vintage aircraft, we did another female pilot shot. And again, this is my favorite reenactor, Allison. Next, we did a World War II uh, uh, couple of shots with, using a B-25 and a TBM Avenger and a C-47. The museum also let us use several World War II vehicles they had on display. This shot was done from the control tower that was no longer in use and now part of the mu museum display. Creating scenes like this one is really a rare opportunity. Usually displays like this at air shows are full of people, but the museum did a fantastic job at making uh, this a very much controlled environment to shoot in. You can really see the difference when people are missing in this angle. You can also see the control tower that I took the previous image from. The TBM Avenger was an aircraft bomber used in the Battle of Midway during World War II, it was a three-man crew. And getting this shot was a real treat as one of these guys came nearly 400 miles just to be a part of a few poses. A night shot also was included with all the aircraft. And again, using daylight flood lamps, we shot one plane at a time. This gets a bit tedious because everything has to be moved in position and lighted up before firing up the engines. If the pilot, uh, if the pilots, uh, if the pilots would uh, throttle up, hold the brakes, um, and uh, when they do that, uh, you can actually see blue flame come out of the exhaust, like you see right here. Um, it's a deafening sound but it's also a real rush. In September 20 of 21, um, I uh, spent a week in Colorado, finally photographing trains. And this has been and always will be my first love. But this was not a normal train shoot. These specific trains uh, were three historic engines that were all together at the same time and most likely will never be, be together again. Locomotive 425 is the original Denver and Rio Grande paint scheme before the railroad became the Denver and Rio Grande Western. It was on its final day of operations before its mandatory rebuild. Period correct freight cars were used for this shoot. Once the rebuild takes place, it will be restored back to number 315. So it was important for me to capture it now. Locomotive 168, Denver and Rio Grande paint scheme before the railroad again became the Denver and Rio Grande Western. Period correct early 1900 passenger cars were used for this period shoot. And then finally, Rio Grande Southern number 20, which is owned by the Colorado Railroad Museum. Uh, it was only there because of a private, uh, because a private entity paid to have it brought up from Golden to Chama, New Mexico. Normally, it only operates at the museum. So seeing her stretch her legs, um, pulling freight cars on a real railroad was spectacular to witness. In November, I did one of the most unique photo shoots I have ever attempted by myself. Earlier in 2021, I visited the Henry River Mill Museum to plan a possible depression era shoot. And I took some test images as well as surveyed the grounds to see if I could uh, make it happen. This picture is actually similar to the same angle used in the Hunger Games when Cass was running to go hunt. I felt like this could work. So with the help of a few friends and their vintage cars, as well as some volunteer reenactors, time travel began again. It was brutally cold that morning, but the ladies were willing to walk barefooted and pose. Clothes were hung and props like gas cans and fenders and wheels and chairs and wash tubs were positioned all over the village 
to move things uh, to um, all over the village, I should say, to help move things along as quickly as possible. As things were repositioned by others, I would do close-up shots. And um, I was renting this place by the hour. So I wanted to maximize my time here as well as maximize my reenactors times. This really made things very efficient. The first series of shots that included the ladies were done first. I wanted the early morning light and by far, this is one of my favorite images. I also knew the girls would tire out quickly, so I worked them first. Keeping them from smiling was the key to pulling this off. Because if you look at depression era images, you don't see people smiling. Of course, every now and then I would take some cat shots to just kind of break up the monotony. Next, I began doing other shots with other props. Vintage lunch buckets helped me make this miner's lunch break. I got the tree stumps from a friend who knew I needed them just for the shoot. He got them from a tree trimming company that happened to stop at the same taco trailer that he frequents. An unexpected prop uh, was on display at the gift shop and it was a copper still. And I seized the moment to use it. The owners of both cars were also my reenactors and their cars had just the patina look that I was hoping for. One of them has a collection of 13 Model A's, including this 1930 Tudor sedan. It has the perfect look of a Depression era car. The other had three cars and a dog, making these images as period correct as I could have hoped for. This 31 Roaster, believe it or not, was landfill. Other than a new top and interior, it's still all original. One of my favorite images um, is called Deliverance. I think the name speaks for itself. The fact that I got lucky with light and fall color is a miracle. Normally color was gone this time of year and most of the leaves are on the ground. The fact that they're still there on trees is because frost didn't happen yet and it kept everything still hanging on. We broke for lunch and then began shooting gangster shots. And since um, I was shy, uh, another guy, I had to suit up for this. So my wife took several images. We did scenes around the same location as we did the earlier shots. Again, just maximizing time. I only wanted to move cars once and the afternoon light favored our second location better. Of course, the good guys always win. My wife dressed up and uh, another photographer friend, Richard Siggins, took a few pictures of us together, like this one that you see here at the second location. I mostly still continued to shoot, however. If there were two guys that just looked like the, looked their parts at whatever they did, it was Mike and Jeff. Both of them were spectacular and equally up for doing whatever I asked them to do. Mike has actually done this before and has been an extra in a few small films. Jeff was a first timer, but he was still fantastic and they played their roles to the letter. My bad guy, Titus, and my wife, Sharon, were also rookies. For them, I had to give them a nudge now and then to look mean and not smile, but they, did, they still did great. Just like personalities, everyone is different and that's what makes this fun. I've reached the point in my career that I'm always looking at ways to incorporate life into what would be a lifeless image. While the beauty and splendor of nature is still mesmerizing to view, when I can add the human element like I did here, it evokes even more emotion. What is sort of ironic with this image is that this young man and his girlfriend were here taking pictures of each other. When they were done, I asked if I could photograph them and he agreed. I placed him in position as you see, and then I took the photo and then took another photo with his camera so that he had a copy. So what's on the agenda for 2022? 
Well, I'm working on a project that involves taking my Model A uh, nearly on a 3,000 mile journey to 13 different states. The goal is to photograph this car in period correct locations involving period correct outfits and props and more. My goal is to continue to replicate scenes from the depression era using as many different people and props as I can round up, like these newspapers I just picked up on eBay. I also am planning on doing another air-to-air -air shoot involving a World War II dogfight. I'm keeping these cards pretty close to my chest as this has never been done before. Suffice to say, if it works, it will truly be a first because these two planes are rarely in the air to begin with and even more rare to be together at the same time in close formation. That being said, this is what I'm going to be shooting from, harnessed in, obviously, to the max. On a serious note, I'm very blessed to be living the dream, to be able to provide for my family while doing something that I love so much truly is a blessing. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that I was learning to walk in the path of others. I think you now, now know what I'm referring to. It's re-stepping through history and recreating scenes um, that has been an exciting journey that I have embarked on. And in a small way, I came full circle on a journey that I began on, creating images that communicate a story. Thanks so much for allowing me to share my passion with you. I truly appreciate it. And if you have any questions, well, fire away. Well, Ken, I will start. Um, I don't uh, really have an, a question right away, but I just want to say, wow, I, I am so appreciative of you sharing your, your photography journey with us. That's, I mean, I'm, I just shake my head at the amount of, of detail that you go to uh, for these period shots and, you know, to get in the actors and the props. Uh, I was sad that you sold all those bicycles, by the way, but, but I, you know, and also your experimentation with the light painting. I mean, you, you have a real passion and I, I'm so appreciative because I know that you probably spent a lot of time putting this program together specifically for Focus Camera Club. I did. So I'm, I'm grateful that you would spend so much time to, to share your journey with us, man. So thank you very much pleasure um it uh i guess it's just kind of the way i'm wired but i can't i don't sit still i don't like to sit still um and i i, I it's it's very easy as a photographer and i think all of you i know i have um you you can be very complacent in what you're doing and i just love pushing myself and pushing myself and pushing myself and so um this uh uh, this quest that I'm on is never ending. I hope it never ends. Me either. <laughs> no, I want to thank you, Ken. Yeah, that was wonderful. Just, yeah, incredible range of things that you've been through over the years. It's uh, pretty cool and inspiring to see. So thank thanks, thanks for sharing. So thanks for, yeah. you know, so much detail on how you did the different um, shots and everything too, you know, and the lighting and the posing and all that is, you know, interesting to hear that, you know, the kind of behind the scenes that we often don't get. Um, so thanks. Yeah, the aircraft uh, stuff was really a bit challenging because uh, um, we use daylight flood lamps, um, about five or six of them. Um, one of the shots that I'm going to be doing you know, this May, um, I'm using some battery powered um, flood lamps because the subject matter is going to be at night, but it's going to be a lot closer. And so I don't need to pile that. And, and I, can't, I can't bring it in the Model A. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you got a lot of pictures of of cloud, well, you had great clouds in your airplane pictures. Were you just lucky? 
Uh, well, the um, yeah, yeah, pretty much it's luck. Okay. Um, the uh, the ground photos, I, I think, is what you're referring to. Yes. And that's just that's just luck. Um, the uh, Willow Run, you couldn't have asked for better puffier clouds uh, than than we got. That was the B25 and the B17. Um, the um, stormy clouds came from the thunderstorm that was in uh, Port Clinton, um, which was a uh, uh, if if you saw the if you I, I should have pointed it out and I didn't, but the one picture of um, uh, of the of the young man holding like five or six suitcases with the gal pointing down. We had actually rehearsed that. We just kept going back. I had a kept yelling, point, you know, pick it up, pick it up. Cause she wouldn't look mean. And so I, I said, I want you to look mean when you do this pick, tell them to pick it up. And so she finally started yelling at him to pick it up. And, uh, but if you looked at underneath the aircraft, it's soaked because the, the plane was outside. So we had to drag the plane back in. My car was sitting outside and all of these Model A's are nothing but, if you looked at the, if you know how a Model A roof is, it's nothing but really chicken wire and some wood and some stuffing and a, and a vinyl top, if you will. So they all leak. So yeah, so we were trying to get the plane in, get my car in another hangar. It was a mess. But then after the storm, you know, the magic happens. So well, yeah, that's a lot of luck. Very impressive. Thank you. Right. Ken, do you use uh, a particular type of film uh, uh, technique to, to make it look more historic? So I've created, uh, good question. So I've created a lot of um, uh, layers, if you will, or textures that I'll either use in Photoshop or uh, um, I kind of, my workflow um, is always to pull the image in raw. And the first thing I wanna do is just eliminate noise and, and, and get you know color balance and all of that stuff taken care of. And then from there, I'll start adding layers, textures and that type of thing. And I kind of, um, I kind of like those depression era images to kind of look a little bit old. Um, and so that's just, again, that's just adding layers and textures of color. Really nice. Would you also uh, talk about your light painting? I mean, among many of the wonderful things you do, uh, those settings were, were really incredible. Uh, it, I've tried light painting and I guess I didn't get to the 12 hour mark because mine were awful. So, <laughs> so, so any tips would be appreciated. Yeah, well, I didn't show you the thousands of awful images that I, that I, that, that, uh, that I had, but uh, uh, there's a couple of different ways of doing light painting and, and, and most um, most of it is almost like layer stacking, if you will. Somebody paints a, you know, some light in, in a section of that image, takes a photo of it, and then you know, obviously, you know, you're not moving the camera, and then they light paint another area and take a picture of that area that they've painted. Um, and so the light looks very even, if you will. And I didn't, I didn't want that effect. Um, I really wanted, um, I wanted shadows in my image. And so in order to get that, um, I did a single exposure. Um, my go-to lens for this, it was an old Nikon 35 to 72.8. Um, that it, and I shot it at F22. Everything was shot at 22 because I wanted a, a razor sharp image. If, and if you're a Nikon guy, this is an old lens. This is a... Uh, um, a lens that you can buy on, on eBay or uh, some other place. If you get one that, that isn't fogged, and that's the only drawback to that lens, if you get one that isn't fogged, you can usually find them for 100 and a half, 200 bucks. Uh, so it's a very inexpensive lens, razor sharp. And um, so 
I used essentially two different types of lights. Um, I used a, a small little pen light um, that was an LED light, and I used a small flashlight that also was an LED light. Um, and the light temperature of both of those were almost identical. So depending on what I was painting, I would have one in one hand and one in the other. And I would, if I was doing a bigger area, say like uh, the typewriter, that typewriter's black and so it needs more light on it. And if I'm doing um, the paper, I'd have the pen, light, the pen light in my other hand. And so then I would turn that light off and I would start painting that light. I always wore black so that I could go in front of the camera and the camera never sees me because the shutter's always open. And there was the kind of the key to that. The other thing that I didn't do is I made sure that light didn't hit the backdrop. So I'm only painting on what is on the desk or on the table or what's actually in that image. Um, it got to the, a, a spot where I could pretty much light paint an image five or six shots. I, I, I really had a good feel for it, but it took a long time to get to that five or six shots. I mean, you know, and the, and I joke about the candles. They started a foot, they ended here. Um, I joke about that, it's, it, but it, 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 it's almost somewhat true. I'd break the candles in half and I'd go through probably two thirds of that candle trying to get the wax to melt the way I wanted the wax to melt. Um, and then uh, lighting all of the camera, uh, lighting all of the candles, you get that flame flicker. And so you can't move. It's really, really hard to just be in front of all of that when you kill the lights and have those candles burning and whatnot, because any movement in the room and you know what's going to happen, that candle is going to flicker. And I wanted all of those lights to be pointing straight up. And I, because uh, believe me, when they're frozen and they're at an angle, they look very stupid. They look silly. And so it was just a battle, but I was, I'm a conqueror, if you will. It's just, I'm, I'm competitive. I play competitive softball. I'm wired this way. And so I was going to get this capture and I didn't care how long it was going to take. And, uh, uh, I, I was happy to get the three candles and I got the, the, the other one. And if I never did another candle shot, I would be okay with that. So, so Ken, you didn't do anything to modify the uh, color of the light. You just use an LED. Did you work the color temperature then later in post-processing or something? Yeah, I did all of that in, in post-processing. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Was the smoke a big problem from the candles? Yes, absolutely it was. And uh, uh, I had to, uh, uh, so what I did is as soon as that one second exposure was up, I'd stand in front of the camera. Again, I'm all dressed in black, but I'm blowing and I'm trying to move that smoke out of there as fast as I can. Um, yeah, so it was, it was humorous to watch if you were there for about the first five minutes and then you're like, this guy's nuts. Yeah, um, a tip to blow out candles or to put out the flame is if you use wax from another candle or use a, a candle and stick that in the flame right at the top of the wick, let the molten wax drip onto that wick. You won't get smoke if you do it right. Well, that's good to know if I ever decide to do it again. Right, right. Anyway, just a tip. Yeah, no, that's good to know. I think in your next presentation, you need a video of your two-fisted lights and blowing out the candles. I, I, I think that would put it over the top. Yeah, I, you know, I, it, um, I had taken a video of, of me trying to do, I wasn't doing the candles, but I was trying to do the light painting. But unfortunately, you'd see that set up there. But as soon as you kill the lights, all you saw was this light kind of bouncing around all over the place. 
So you really couldn't see anything. Ken, I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about the kind of the backstory, especially the one with the railroad where you went in and, and you know, some of the people, you know, became your props and, you know, how did you convince them, well, I would like to, you know, set off a smoke bomb and I would like to install some lights in, 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 in the headlight. I mean, that takes a lot of either finesse or time or you, you, you've had a background in sales or something. But that's rare, you know, most people are going to just say, get the, get the heck out of here, you know, and you and your camera, you know, pronto. Oh, I've had a lot of that too. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Uh, the East Broadtop. So how that all came about, um, I, you know, one, I've been photographing trains for years. So you develop relationships and that's, that's, that's huge. It's, it's like any other business you businesses are built on relationships and so photographing trains for so many years doing magazine work and stuff like that I, I developed a lot of relationships um I have a friend who um uh knew about the East Broad Top and so that's that was the connection and uh doing the smoke bombs and that type of stuff um the East Broad Top was very eager to receive images because they're trying to get their railroad in, in order and up. And so okay. it was kind of a mutual thing. The same kind of holds true uh, to some extent for any of the museum shots. Uh, they always get a copy of the images, so they use it for their promo. So it's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship, if you will. Well, that explains a lot. Thank you. I mean, the other question that I had for you is, is I believe that I heard that you've kind of given up going to art festivals. And these are more, these are more projects that you just have a passion for. And so you're not really looking to actively sell these other than maybe through your website. And is that, is that a correct statement? So um, here it, again, it, it, in, in short, yes, that's a correct statement. How that came about was um, we really pivoted during COVID. We really started um, doing a lot of marketing. Uh, I, I currently have somebody in Australia that actually does my marketing for me on Facebook um, and for our website. And so we made that pivot and we found that with so many people being at home, they were in front of their computers. And that was an untested field for, for a lot of people. And if you were willing to make that pivot, um, you know, fortunately I got very blessed and I realized that, Hey, I don't need to do art shows anymore. And so um, it's allowed me to actually spend more time creating images and do people buy depression era images? Probably not. I mean, I've, we've sold some and we've, you know, we've done, uh, well, we j actually just took our calendars off. Um, but we did a 13 month, uh, we do a 13 month calendar. We had uh, our calendars up there um, uh, for the holidays. That's kind of a, a holiday type of purchase and whatnot. Um, is somebody gonna put a depression era image in, in their website or on their living room uh, wall that's uh, you know eight feet long? No, um, but I've also found that it creates curiosity. And so people go to visit the website and they end up purchasing something that they didn't, weren't intending to purchase because they visited the landscape section or they visited the tree section and, and that type of thing. So, yeah. Ken, I had a question about uh, the previous question, I believe that Dave had asked you. Uh -huh. And I was wondering when he was asking about the trains, I was wondering if the same holds true for the, uh, all the shots that you took of the airplanes because you said that they you know they brought them out at night and everything so did you know somebody there too and then you also mentioned we so do you travel with people that help yes you this? so great question so there's a there's a group of us that that uh, are into vintage aircraft there's another group of us that are into trains and that's how we split the cost mm. to give you an idea there's six of us that are doing um, 
a, I, I mentioned that we're going to be doing a World War II fighter pilot type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably close to 20,000. Wow. To get three aircraft up in the air for about 90 minutes. So we're mm -hmm. splitting that cost between six guys. Okay. So you got so you got to find people that are very committed in doing that. To right. rent a steam locomotive for a day is about 15,000. Mm. So That's again, cool. you got to find a group of guys that are committed to doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, um, that's that's where the we comes in. Okay. Yeah, great question. And did you have to have special permission to, or you just worked it out by talking to them about what you wanted to do? I just wonder if you need any kind of special permission or anything. No, you usually you. Well, one, they're happy to get fifteen grand for the day. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so they're they're happy with that. Um, as far as a question you didn't ask, but um, you'll find this quite interesting. If you start searching for reenactors, there mm -hmm. are hundreds of links either on Facebook or other websites where people are are into reenacting from anything that you could possibly think of, all the way down to the dark ages. Really? And yes, it's hmm. quite quite amazing. Yeah. I was actually quite surprised. That's that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so well, much. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed it. You know, I'm, <laughs> I hope you guys uh are inspired to go do something other than uh, not uh, not that landscapes aren't aren't bad. They're fun. I enjoy them. But uh, it's a great way of stretching yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes I've uh, just to just to be different. Sometimes I plop one lens on, and I'm like, you know, that's what I'm taking with me that day, and I'm going to use it. And I usually will do that with a fixed lens, mm -hmm. so that you have to move in and out. You can't you can't cheat doing this. You know. Right. <laughs> Well, I won't be hanging from the back of any planes, but I love well, the steel life. <laughs> I, I, can, I, I can tell you that, uh, so how that all came about, um, uh, last year, the FAA um, stopped allowing paid passengers riding in vintage aircraft shooting another aircraft, another mm -hmm. vintage aircraft. So they stopped it. Oh, the FAA right. said, no, you can't do that anymore. So the, the, the B-17 shots that I got where they're way off in the distance and stuff like that, and you got that whole beautiful side view and whatnot, mm -hmm. we didn't know what we were gonna do. And um, uh, we came up with, with the idea of hanging out the back end of but that's called a that's actually called a sky van, and that's what uh, um, skydivers use. They'll jump out of the back mm. end of the sky, what they call a sky van. Mm. And so uh, we're all D ringed in, and we're going to be harnessed in. And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that we have to do. Um, uh, we have to double lanyard our cameras to us. Can't wear hats. Can't no lens caps. None of that stuff because if it falls off. Yeah. It ends up, you know, mm -hmm. hitting the plane that we're trying to photograph. Not a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. no. <laughs> well, very cool. Good. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I think that kind of wraps it up, Kim. But again, you know, thank you very, very much because, you know, you put a tremendous amount of, of your own time into this presentation for us. Yeah. So it's, it's very much appreciated. It's very different. Thanks, I don't think I've ever seen anything along these lines or not. So, so when you're out in Colorado, please give us a shout. We would love to, to meet you, buy you a cup of coffee. Hope, hopefully sure. your projects later this year with a you know, being, you know, being harnessed into the back end of a plane, you know, 
hope all these go well. I know you 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 talked about taking your Model A, I believe it was, or Model T. I'm sorry. Model A, yeah. Model A, you know, to a variety of states. So I hope that 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 project goes extremely well for you. That's the goal. Um, yeah. So I hope I hope I hope it does. Our first uh, our first photo shoot is going to be in May with the car. So and I'm lining all of that up now. Good. So. All righty. Thanks again. Thank right. You. right. Good night. Thank you, Ken, very much. Thank you, Ken. Good night, everybody.